Perfect. Thank you, Jay. All right. So as Shackleton and his men continued further and further towards the continent of Antarctica, the ice pack eventually began to thicken even more and more. Their attempts failed about hacking and shoveling through the ice, and this was no longer working. One frigid morning, they woke up and the ice was almost a foot thick. There was no reason to continue. It was just exhausting and wearing down on his men. And so Shackleton made the decision to leave the boat aside and camp out on the ice. Now, this was relatively easy going as they still had access to all of their necessary supplies they had. And so at this time, Shackleton realized that ultimately his original plan had failed. Now, he was leading a rescue mission, a matter of survival, despite his burning passion to cross the entire continent of Antarctica. So uh, perhaps more accurately, he valued his men over his mission. He realized that the most important part of his mission was the lives of his men and not actually the mission itself, which was crossing the Antarctic. And so uh, the survival mode kind of kicked in as they made a routine, which included things like hunting penguins and seals. Uh, they continued to ice fish uh, through the ice, which was still tough work. Um, they kept the morale up by playing soccer and uh, playing a little bit of music and singing with the men. Uh, Shackleton really had a care for his men, and this was shown later in the story, as we'll talk about. And so his plan was to wait for the ice to melt, for the summer to come, for the winter to fade off, and for them to go off into open sea to the, uh, the island of South Georgia. Uh, ultimately, it was going to be much more difficult than this, and they would spend many months wandering around. So this giant ice fall was hundreds of miles wide and was spinning clockwise, slowly trapping the men away from Antarctica, actually, and closer to civilization. But little did they know this was still a thousand mile journey to the nearest port. Um, now, this was basically at the beginning of the winter. And as the season was slowly moving forward, temperatures would commonly reach like 20 below zero. The men were really suffering during this time and were very uneasy as during many months of the entire winter, there was only a few hours of daylight, maybe two to three hours of daylight in the entire day. And so it was really messing with um, the men and they were uneasy during this time. So eventually the ice became worse, crushing the ship, as you can kind of see in this picture, crushing the ship between giant blocks of ice. It got even worse than this, this where basically the ice was rising 10 feet above the hole over the deck. Um, this ultimately, these giant frozen blocks of ice weighing hundreds of tons, crushed the ship, and they were soon forced to abandon it and set off on foot. Now, they saved a little bit of the supplies, but many things couldn't be scavenged as it was in the end sinking. And so they got three of the lifeboats and the dog sleds and basically drug it across the frigid landscape. Now, um, they set up these dog sleds to be pulled by men, as you can see in that photo, and these lifeboats weighed several tons each. It was grueling work in the bitter cold uh, where progress was extremely slow and they had a little to no food. And so Shackleton assigned himself the same amount of work as the men themselves, as he was what you would call a servant leader, despite him not actually being a Christian. And so as the journey, as the journey continued and they began, uh, excuse me, and the, as they got closer to open sea um, and as the winter faded into summer, the seas became warmer, the, the climate was uh, basically a little bit better, and the ice started breaking beneath them. They could see in the distance killer whales zigzagging through the broken, the broken floats of ice um, as they continued. And it culminated one night when all the men were seasick because of the constant bobbing up and down of the ice on top of the sea. And actually one of the guys, the, the ice crushed beneath him or shattered, and he fell into the sea in his sleeping bag. And so Thankfully, he was saved as some of the men had a lot of experience um, at sea. And so um, they continued with their journey. After about 13 to 14 months of wandering, the men eventually reached open sea and rowed away in the three lifeboats they had. Now, the waves were growing bigger than the boat themselves. The men were constantly bailing while sitting in this icy Antarctic water. And eventually, they reached the uninhabited, unhospitable uh, inhospitable elephant island. Now, like we mentioned already, this was basically just a mound of rock and ice. There wasn't much here, except there were seals that could be killed for food. Um, and so they were, they were well fed at this point. Um, the, the climate was so bad that they basically turned over the remaining lifeboats and slept in them for shelter. So 
No rescue came to Elephant Island after a few days, and Shackleton was again faced with another tough decision. Um, he eventually decided to take five of his men to set out from Elephant Island to try to find the South Georgia Island, which was nearly an 800 mile journey away. Now, the target was some four to five miles wide, this South Georgia Island. They were on choppy seas and they had to navigate only by the stars and some rudimentary tools like a compass and a sextant. So riding on the choppy ocean in a 22 foot long lifeboat um, that was only mostly seaworthy was a tough task. They even survived a hurricane while at, at sea. Um, pretty, pretty grueling stuff. And so eventually Shackleton and his five men reached the island, but they were still on the wrong side. The, the adventure wasn't over yet. They had to cross the unmapped, glacier-capped, crevice-filled mountain range on foot. Now this, like I mentioned, was only about five to four, mi four to five miles wide, but it was a long island, probably about 50 miles. And so the men, what would normally take probably a three to four day journey, took them almost a week or two. Um, because of the, the rugged landscape. So they are in constant danger, bitter cold, and again, little to no supplies. And eventually Shackleton reached the safety of the whaling village on the other side of South Georgia Island. Now it took many months and several unsuccessful tries to sail back to rescue the remaining 21 men. But eventually Shackleton's rescue mission was successful and every man survived. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Long months bringing light to extreme darkness. Torture, jeers, and flogging possible. Chains and imprisonment a danger. Occupational hazards include stoning, being sawn into, and death by sword. Shabby clothing, destitution, persecution, and mistreatment a concern. Reward, unlikely in this life, but forgiveness, peace, and joy are yours. Shackleton and his crew certainly had a challenging and adventurous mission, but men, we have been getting a, given an exciting mission, a sometimes dangerous mission. Our, our mission has been stated in, in a couple ways. Uh, go and make disciples of all nations. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and your neighbor as yourself. Or maybe to, to act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with your God. To be ambassadors for Christ, to give a drink of water to the least of these, to love your enemies. This is our mission. Now, when everything went wrong for Shackleton, he may have realized that the lives of his men were more important than his mission, but our situation is slightly different. See, the lives of your men aren't more important than your mission. The lives of your men are one of the most important parts of your mission. Now, I don't know where this mission will take you. It might be a daring expedition to Antarctica, maybe. Thinking back to my battalion friends over the years, their missions have taken them to be a, a leader of a squadron of Marines, to work as a chef in a commercial kitchen, to repair military copters to lead ecological studies deep in the forest, to serve their communities as a police officer. Some run a plumbing and heating company, others lead an HVAC installation team. One oversees a mathematics department, one is studying to be a, math, a graphic designer. Some lead men's Bible studies, many of them raise families. Some serve as church elders, some clean up chairs and bathrooms around the church, some run a ch church food bank, and still others preach the gospel in foreign countries to hostile peoples. So I don't know what dangerous and exciting place your mission may take you, but I do know that right now, right now your mission includes battalion. And I do know that one of the most important parts of this mission is the lives of the men around you. I'm talking to you adult leaders, I'm talking to the sergeants, the corporals, the lance corporals, and the non-coms. God has given you your battalion as part of your mission, and these other men are one of the most important parts of that mission. Now, some of you guys, you've been on, on expeditions, you've been in situations, you've been at camp where your physical life was in danger. I've heard of guys who they reached out and they grabbed someone who was losing his balance on a cliff, who have spotted an error and somebody's not before they started climbing 
Who has reminded someone to tighten their life jacket before they head into a big rapid? Who's put a hand out before somebody stepped into traffic? Who administered first aid when someone was injured? All, all cases where the, the men's lives were of utmost concern. But thankfully, these situations are rare. And thankfully, your men have been there for you. The dangerous situations I'm mostly worried about are far more common, and they may have more serious consequences. For many men, like you and like me, these situations include the many sexual temptations, extreme selfishness and greed, a pride that puts you far above other people, despair or doubts that God's forgiveness and his love might not be for you, abusing the authority you've been given, knowing the right thing to do, but being paralyzed with fear in the moment and unable to act, responding with hatred and anger. These are the types of dangerous situations that you're likely to encounter. These are situations where you're going to need God's grace. And he often uses the men around you to warn and counsel you. Men who will reach into the freezing water and pull you out, sleeping bag and all. These are the men in your battalion. Well, how do we do it? How are we to look out for the lives of the battalion men around us? Well, God tells us in the book of Hebrews. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 24, 25. I'll, I'll read it again. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawn near. The battalion year is just starting. God has given you a mission, and one of the most important parts of that mission is the lives of the battalion men around you. So how might Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, look like in your battalion? Well, perhaps like this. Non-coms, I challenge you to focus on verse 25, the part about meeting together. You have an important role at battalion. Everyone wants you there. It's the whole reason that we have a battalion, because you guys are there. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. It is a tremendous encouragement to your corporals and the adult men when you, have, when you are there. We love battalion because you are there. Encourage us by being present. To you, Lance corporals. I want you to think of some ways to support your corporal with love and good works. Your corporal needs someone to be engaged with the squad time devotions, to volunteer quickly and take initiative, to help the guys learn their skills. He needs someone he can delegate to and someone he can trust. He needs someone who can help fill in when he is away. This is how you fulfill Hebrews 10. This is how you look out for the life of your corporal. Corporals, the men in your squad need you to set an example, to have their backs, to encourage them. Now, I know they've heard God's word in squad time and counseling, and that's great. They've seen it lived out while you're on expeditions. But they need someone to set an example and show them how to follow Christ at school, with their friends and in sports. Hang out with them outside of battalion. How do you complete your mission when it's difficult? When you're around a crowd that ridicules faith in Christ? What do you do with doubts? How do you flee temptation? How does God make the things that you know you ought to do turn into the things that you really want to do? How do you confess and seek God's forgiveness? How do you forgive others? How do you live in God's grace? Your men need an example of these things. Spend time with them and look for ways to show them. Sergeants, you are in a unique position of working directly with the adult men and also with the young men of your battalion. You have the role of ambassador. You are the eyes and ears of the battalion. Look for things the adult men are missing, the things they've forgotten about being a junior high and senior high, the new things that, that you know, we never experienced, and then think of ways to motivate these adult men to love and good works. At the same time, look out for what the young men need but are unable to articulate to their adult leaders, to their corporals. Or maybe they're too afraid to ask. 
how can you motivate these younger men to love and good works? If you follow Jesus, you have been given a mission. It can be strenuous at times and it can be dangerous at times, but it's often exciting. And one of the most important parts of this mission is the lives of those battalion men around you. As you begin this battalion year, remember Hebrews 10. How can you stir up one another? How can you encourage one another? God may use you as he saves the man next to you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you at the beginning of a new battalion year. We want to be bright and keen for you. We want to be part of your mission. But we need your grace when we come up short. We need your power to change our hearts. Help us stir up one another to love and good works. And as we meet together, help us to encourage one another. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>